Children's Church Preschool, you guys are out of here. Praise the Lord. Rest of you, go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, is where we're going to pick up this morning. Now, last week we started on decisions. The choices we make will bring blessing or cursing. That is true. We got we got pretty blunt about a few things. You know, people trying to say people are born certain ways. You aren't born. You make choices. You make choices. Hello. Those decisions affect you. Are you here? You, you know, I'm going to tell you something. You could choose to forgive or choose to live in bitterness. You could choose to uh, forgive or choose to be bound by hatred. Hello. You can choose to forgive or go spend four hundred dollars a week on some stupid couch somewhere with some bozo telling you, telling you, tell you how you feel. You know, how do you feel today? Why do you feel this way? I know, I know a pastor, um, um, pastor's wife's sister. She started going to see us, and actually, pastor's daughters. They were, these people were pastor's daughters. And, and the daughter uh, saw a psychiatrist long enough, they convinced her her father had molested her when she was a child. He never did. But through enough years of, of psycho babble, she came and, would not, and had a restraining order against him and, and, and wouldn't see him and, and was convinced that her father had, had molested her as a child because this counselor talked her into believing that. Probably what happened when the counselor had issues with men and projects out on everybody else they talk to and get paid for it. Man haters. Well, you know, we have decisions to make in life. You can choose to hate or you can choose to forgive. And let me say something. Even if somebody's done you wrong or, or done things to you, listen, you don't have to live your life based on what somebody did to you as a child. You can forgive, ask God to cleanse you uh, of all of that stuff and go on and be productive in life. And you don't have to be dysfunctional at the rest of your life. Because when you do that, you just let them win. You let the whole circumstance win in your life. And that circumstance was sent by the devil in the first place. Yeah. Hallelujah. But, uh, you know, God gave us the right to choose. We, we use Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20, and Joshua 24, 15 through 22 uh, last week as the basis of, of this. You can go look those things up. We started in with Bible characters have made bad decisions, and we, we just jumped right down there in David, and that's, that's a really good one. Uh, you know, we talked about how David didn't go to war. When he didn't go to war, he saw Bathsheba naked taking a bath. When he saw Bathsheba naked taking a bath, his flesh took over. He called her over to the house. He had sex with her. She, had, she got pregnant. He called her husband back, tried to have him have sex with her so he could cover up his sin. That didn't work, so he had him killed. Hello. All those decisions based on, you know, out of that one bad decision, all those other things and all the events took place because of a bad decision. Let's look at other people in the Bible who made some bad decisions. Let's look at uh, maybe the mother of all bad decisions in Genesis chapter 3. I mean, this may be the mother of all bad decisions. Okay. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. Now, I've read back through just chapters 1 and 2 and never saw where God said, Don't touch it. As a matter of fact, God told Adam and Eve they were to dress the garden, to keep the garden. They only told them, he only told them not to eat of that fruit. Now, here's the problem. You don't talk to the devil and have conversations with the devil unless you're telling him what to do. You don't reason. The Bible doesn't say, get the devil and say to him, come let us reason together. God said, come let us, him and the mankind, reason together, but not you and the devil. You don't have discussions with the devil. Are you here? The devil is not your, uh, your, your confidant. You don't argue or try to talk to him because he is subtle and he is a deceiver. The Bible even calls him in the book of Revelation, which cast out the great deceiver. So you don't, you don't listen to the devil. People listen to the devil. People of the devil listen to the devil. They get totally deceived. They believe all kinds of stupid stuff. Like God's not, God doesn't exist. You know? Uh, well, you know, you can believe God that you know, the fool says in his heart that God, there is no God. You may have enough faith to believe that everything you see around you just happened. You're deceived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello. Well, man's created life in a test tube. Yeah, man created. Somebody created it. It didn't happen by happen chance. We have no recorded event anywhere that man, anybody's observed the creation of life outside of interference by some other whatever. You can't, you can't find walking out in the desert, watching it going, boom, life was created. It takes a lot of faith for them and that stuff, you know? Hallelujah. But deceiver, he's a deceiver. Satan will deceive you. 
He'll try to deceive you into making the wrong decisions. It's okay. We love each other. Usually is the uh, statement used when uh, someone's trying to deceive someone into having relations, physical, sexual, let's go, sex, sex outside of marriage. It's all right. We love each other. Well, that's not what the Bible said. The Bible didn't say just as long as you love each other, it's okay to fornicate. Now, does it? No. It says, if, it says, actually, it says, if you go burn and marry, if you can't control yourself, get married. Hello. Amen. All right. So the Satan is subtle. I mean, he, he already had he tongue-tied and messed up. We, we may eat of all the trees, but we can't t eat, to eat or even touch that tree. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. A challenge. Listen to this. Not only does he challenge what God said would be the result, he challenges the integrity of the intent of God. And he says here, For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let me say something. God, Adam was already created in the likeness and image of God. He was already, don't get flaked out by this, but in the, one sense, a little God. He was created, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, What is man that thou art mindful of him? For thou hast created him. Now the King James uses the word angels. Thou hast created him a little lower than the angels. The word translated angels in the Psalm, I believe the eighth Psalm, is Elohim, which is one of the names of God. It can, actually, Elohim means majesty in the plurality of three or more. That's his literal meaning. It also can mean or can refer to heavenly beings. But when, um, when talking of Jesus in the, in the, in, um, the New Testament, it says, What has been in our mouth and for thou has created him a little lower than the angels? But really, it's God. He's got to be God. I said, God, Adam, Jesus was not created lower than the angels. Amen? Man was, not, man was in the class of God. Man was created as a replica, as an, a, a, an express image of God. God took up his own spirit. <clears throat> of all the created things that God created, the only one where he took his spirit out and put in something, and that, 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 uh, that body he formed out of the dust of the earth was mankind. God created man in his likeness and his image. So man <clears throat> was already a God. Now, don't get weird. I'm not saying he was God. He was created in the image of God. And so, <coughs> in, in, refer, in, in, in response to Satan's statement, you shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. God created man in his own class without the knowledge of evil. Which tells me that the knowledge of good and evil is not good. Well, you can minister to the prostitute better if you've been a prostitute. Hogwash. <laughs> Uh, everybody, everybody that's ever come out of prison, they get saved. Somebody thinks they're supposed to go back and be, have a prison ministry. Not if you're not anointed. Right. You're, if you're not anointed to have a prison ministry, you're not anointed to have a prison ministry. I don't care how many years you spent in there. Well, they know the deal. See, it's not you knowing the deal that, get, that helps the people. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. It's not that you used to shoot up or, or prostitute or pimp that's going to help you reach people. It's do you have the anointing to bring the people, praise God. It's not experiencing what others have experienced that equips you to help people. What equips you to help people is, listen, Jesus never pimped. Hello? Jesus never shot up. Jesus didn't get drunk. Jesus didn't run around. Jesus didn't have a, you know, Jesus wasn't a, 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 a prostitute. Jesus didn't do any of the things that you people say he wouldn't go to prison. Hello? Yet, he was effective at ministry to everyone. Amen. So understand that. Don't get caught up in, in man's ideas. I tell you, you take some people, put them back in prison ministry, and they'll fall right back into the trap of that lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. Hello? They're not anointed to do it. You go send the people down to the pubs and stuff to witness to, to drunks and stuff, and that's what they came out of. You'd be, you'd be down there at the bar, they'll be hung out and drunk on the end of the bar. I was witnessing the four people got drunk. Well, <laughs> you got to be anointed. Yeah, go ahead. You said you got to be anointed. Yeah, yeah. So the knowledge of good, now I came off the knowledge of good and evil is not good. 
What is good? The knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. Walking with God. You can help people when you walk with God. You can walk in the gifts. I'm telling you. See, people want to substitute natural knowledge for the gifts of the Spirit. God wants to use the gifts of the Spirit to reach people in places. And people want, mankind wants to use natural knowledge to reach people in hard places. I am telling you it is the power of God that sets the captive free. Amen. All right. And, when, and listen, so knowing both good and evil, so now, and when the woman saw, now he's done got her tricked, that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and desired to make one wise. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three sins. I said, those are the three sins. Same three temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And it was a tree desired to make one wise, pride of life. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it to her husband who's over on the other side of the garden fishing. Now, now I kid you not. I remember one Sunday school quarter. How certain things stand out in your mind, it's amazing. But I remember as a kid, in my Sunday school quarterly, they would always have a picture in them. You know, for the younger kids. Because it was, you know, you know how we teach kids. We use, we use picture imagery a lot of times to teach less. They don't read the whole quarterly. And so the Sunday school quarterly, when I was a young kid, you know, you would draw your picture for the week. And I remember the one where Adam was over there fishing, minding his own business, and Eve came up behind him with the fruit to give him. It was a, of course, I always use an apple for some reason. It wasn't an apple. It was, we don't know what it was. And passed over there and reached over there and handed him the apple. He didn't. And it's like, oh, my God, woman, what have you done? And he's right there. I said he was right there. The Bible says he was right there. Hello, and did and gave also unto her husband with her, and he, he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig loops together and made them aprons. And we don't have to read the rest of the story right here. Let's stop. Here, now, now back up real quick over into um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, or verse 27. Oh, well, we'll go to verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let, uh, so what's he talking about? He's talking about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And not, not, it's not talking about the, the, the Roman gods. It's talking about the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Ghost. Although they weren't named in that manner until the New Testament. We're talking about the, he's talking about the, 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 the Trinity. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Ghost. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them, let them man, man, mankind, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the, uh, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And like Buddy Harrison used to say, thank God we've got authority over creeps. <laughs> Hallelujah. So created, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, uh, he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That tells you you can't have homosexuality because homosexuality doesn't fruitful or multiply. And it doesn't replenish. Amen. Hello. And subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the face, or moveth upon the earth. Notice God said to subdue it. What did God do? God gave Adam authority. Right here, when he created them, and this whole deal is done, Adam and Eve are standing there, God goes, have dominion, have authority, do this, do that. I'm putting it on you, baby. Next chapter, verse 1, the devil shows up. What's Adam supposed to do? Forget Eve. Yeah. I know there's an old joke, where would man be if it weren't for a woman? They said, in the garden. By himself? Where's the fun in that? Yeah. Hello? Y'all here, y'all going home? Oh, by myself. All right, anyway. Sorry, it just happens. Pastor Ed, the singing pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. 
the serpent comes to the woman, starts having a conversation for her, and what should have happened is Adam goes, I take authority over you. Yes. You crawl on your belly all the days of your life. Eat dust all the days of your life. You're not deceiving us. Yes. That's what should have happened. But what did he do? Dodo brains <laughs> stands there and watches this. Let's see what the woman's going to do. God didn't say stand back and watch and see what somebody does. He said have dominion and subdue. Yeah. <laughs> but Adam, for some unknown reason, we don't know why. We, we, we may not ever find. God might not even tell us when we get to heaven. Hello? I think the thinker might be Adam. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do Anyway, that's a joke, guys. Come on, laugh. Yeah, that's good. All Adam had to do was step forward right at that moment and take authority and over Satan and bind him with the authority God gave him. We wouldn't have the rest of the Bible. Hello? Jesus would have never had to come. Are y'all here? So that's why I call it the mother of all bad decisions. He should have exercised his authority. Instead, he watched her eat the fruit. And what happened to her when she ate the fruit? She died spiritually. Now, if you'll go back to the previous chapter where God said, In the day thou eatest the fruit thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, if you've got any, any good Bible with a good margin uh, rendering in it, we'll have beside that some kind of letter, you know, say in the middle of your margin, it'll say, or in dying thou shalt die. That's, a, that's that literally what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says that when, when God said to Adam and Eve that in the day that thou eatest the fruit thereof, thou shalt surely die, the Hebrew literally says, in dying thou shalt die. In other words, what? You're going to die spiritually. You're going to be separated from God, and then you will ultimately die physically. Now let me guarantee you one thing. If Eve had fallen over and completely dead the moment she bit the apple or the fruit or whatever it was, Adam wouldn't have eaten it. <laughs> What did happen was the glory went out. And he saw a change and he followed suit. And Adam, we say this, Adam was the first man to be born again. He was born from life unto death. Satan became his spiritual father in the moment that he transgressed the commands of God. God, he did not die physically at that moment. Hello? We know he didn't. It took him 900 years to die. What happened? He died spiritually. See, understand listen, the consequence. Think of the consequence of this one decision. For all mankind, one decision. I'm telling you, your decisions have consequences. Now, good or bad, but they have consequences. This one decision, in fact, affected the entire human race to the degree that God had to send his own son to redeem them. Because Adam didn't take his authority. I'm telling you, you, as a Christian, you need to take your authority. You need, when opportunities arise and there are circumstances there, you better take your authority. Don't, don't pull an Eve. And don't pull, actually, don't pull an Adam. Because yeah. it was Adam who could have stepped forward at that moment, pushed her aside and said, stop. I take authority over you, serpent. I take authority over you, Satan. I bind you. He didn't have to use the name of Jesus. Jesus hadn't come. He had the authority. He just, all he had to say was, I bind you. And I cast you out. I break your authority to communicate with us and to function this way. You're bound. That's all he had to do. That's all he had to do. Why didn't, I don't know why he didn't. God designed it so he wouldn't. Listen, God don't make you, God didn't tell you not to do something then make you do it. How dumb is that? It's called, it's called dumb doctrine. Dumb dumb doctrine. A dumb dumb, he dumb dumb. It's just dumb doctrine. God makes you a prostitute so he can save you. God makes you a drug dealer so he can deliver you. People believe some of the dumbest stuff. 
Well, why? Because they take certain scriptures and don't use the other scriptures that bring balance to them, and they pull all the ones out that feed their pet doctrine and leave all the other ones that, ca that countermand that and bring a balance to it. Hello. And run off and get and just get adamant about it. And then I mean, my, my girls went to school with somebody. And they said, "I believe God makes prostitutes so He can say." And you're just kind of sitting there going, "So God makes them go out there and 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 sin, involve other people in sin, spread communicable diseases or STDs, do all kinds of evil just so He can save them and show how good He is." That's like the guy setting fire on a building and then going and putting it out so he can be known as the guy who put the fire out. We arrest people for that kind of stuff. <laughs> Hello. Adam, had he not went out at the moment, the minute she reached and grabbed that fruit, he could have stopped that out of her hand and said, no. I'll deal with you later, woman. Satan. But he didn't. See the consequence, the cascading consequence. The Bible tells us that death reigned from Adam to Moses, to the law. And then it rained from Moses on up through the law. Until the law, it just reigned over mankind without any law. Then the law came, the law proved it sinful. Death reigns over mankind because of Adam's sin. Are you here? Yeah. One, de one decision sold the entire human race into spiritual captivity and bondage to such a degree that Jesus was the only one who could come and redeem us and bring us out of it. So, we see the consequence. There's another consequence of a bad decision. Another bad decision. We, we'll leave the mother of all bad decisions. Now, I don't need to spend a whole lot of time there. We all know the results of it, don't we? Are y'all wearing clothes this morning? Yeah. <laughs> now, just before you get the wrong image, <laughs> the reason Adam and Eve didn't know they were naked is they were clothed in the glory of God. So much like we, so we got a hint of that when Moses came out of the mount and his face shone so bright they couldn't look over, they had to cover it with a veil. Before the fall, man was covered in the glory. The glory emanated out, you didn't see the body because it was covered in the glory. Are you here? Luminous beings we are. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> This little Star Wars thing comes out there. Yoda had it right on that one. Anyway, <coughs> we were covered, man was covered in the glory. When she ate the fruit and died spiritually, the glory of God went out. And because there was no source of the glory, she became naked. They knew they were naked because the light went out. Hello? It wasn't they were running around naked and just didn't know it. They were covered in something called the glory of God. Hallelujah. Jesus experienced that on the Mount of Transfiguration to the degree it changed the color of his clothes. Hello? I tell you, the glory of God's powerful. I said, the glory of God's powerful. Hallelujah. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel. I know, we're, we're going to get to some better stuff eventually. How about that, okay? Chapter 15. But you gotta, you've got to see, I want, I want you to understand the consequences of not making good decisions or the repercussions of the decisions so that you'll be aware of that it's important to make the right decisions. Some people get weird. They get weird with their Christianity. They get weird with the walk with the Lord. They come, come along and, you know, oh, I'm saved. I'm under grace. I don't have to do anything. And everything's just going to work out hunk of doors somehow. No, 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 no. You've got responsibilities. One of them is make right decisions. They that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. What does that mean? You follow, the, you make decisions based on the leading of the Holy Ghost. You just don't kind of float through life and, and Tiny Tim singing tiptoe through the tulips. I'm going to have Nathan bring his ukulele one night and just sing it for us just so we can, we can use it as a sermon illustration. And he does Tiny Tim too good. Anyway, <clears throat> it's freaky scary. Anyway. You just don't go through life and, and you and you're automatically make the right decision here and the right because you're under grace. No, you have to make, you, just, you have to choose. You're going to face, you're going to face decisions. Constantly you're going to face decisions. And whether you make the right one or the wrong one will, will, will determine which way you, things go for you. Amen? And you ever been hiking on a trail and you had to come to a fork and you got to make a decision. Which one do I take? If you take the wrong one, you could be walking until Jesus comes back. 
Hello? First Samuel chapter 15. Now we know uh, uh, Saul has been sent, he's gone to battle, and the word of the Lord is to kill everything. Don't bring anything back alive. Don't bring any sheep. Don't bring any spoil. Kill everything. So we get down here about uh, verse, <clears throat> and you'll see in here uh, that Saul gives in to the leaders, and they, they want to take the best of the sheep and the stuff. And of course, then he, he reasons out that it's okay to take some of the good stuff and sacrifice to the Lord. That's not what the Lord told him to do. So you can reason stuff out and come up with a plan, and it sounds really good. That's called a good plan. But that extra O in there gets you in trouble. Yeah. Hello? Because you end up going, oh. I'm telling you, that extra O in the plan can get you in trouble. So Saul gave in to the, his, his leaders and decided to let them do it. And then here comes the prophet. Now, prophets didn't put up with junk. Hello? Why? They just spoke what thus saith the Lord. They didn't get time to reason it. They didn't get time to, uh, you know, have a committee meeting about it. They didn't sit around and discuss whether it was a good idea or not. They just said, thus saith the Lord. And the prophet came right after you disobeyed. You really didn't want to see him. Hello? So let's be, you know, let's, oh, we, we, we better back up. We'll just start in verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord in the Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, Carmel, I'm not Carmel, <laughs> I'm thinking about Hershey's, all right. Uh, Carmel, and behold, he set up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I'm telling you, it's amazing when you get deceived. So you can make a wrong, Satan can trick you into making a wrong decision. You can get so deceived, you're doing right, you're going to tell everybody, I'm following God. The Lord led me over here, and the Lord told me to do this, and the Lord said that, and the Lord said this. The Lord told me not to do this, and the Lord said go do that. And, the, and you know, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Some, I, 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 I have a... <laughs> I have a hard time. I knew this was going to look real good on the internet, but anyway. I have a hard time with people who tell me constantly, God showed them this, and God told them that, and God said do this, and God said do that, and they're not even doing what the Bible's already said do, to do written-wise. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I got people who, who, who won't even do what the Bible says and, 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 and just, just come to church. And every time you turn around, they got a revelation. God showed them this. God showed them that. God spoke to them and told them to do this. God spoke to them and told them not to do that. God told them to leave. God told them to go over there. God said, I mean, I, <clears throat> and here's Samuel coming to Saul. Saul sees Samuel and says, hey, bless me the prophet. Now, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. There's the prophet of God. Hey, dude, I did exactly what God said do. He's all over himself. That's what happens when you get deceived. When you make decisions contrary to God, God will give you to your own devices. I know you don't want to hear that. I know you don't want to hear that. And I know you don't want to hear that. And I know you might want to turn me off right now and go listen to somebody that tells you that because you're under some kind of dispensation that nothing ever is going to go wrong in your life. But I am telling you, you, have to, you need to follow God and obey God and do what God said to do. The way God, or you will be deceived into thinking that what you did was right because you didn't get, you didn't, have, you didn't fall dead the minute you ate the fruit. Now let me say, if somebody said in prophecy, the Lord says those who don't follow me will die, and somebody got in church and said I ain't following him, fell dead, everybody bit the altar. Yeah, I will serve God. I'll do whatever you say do. Pastor, what did God say do? Just double check. Look, can you be my bounce sounding board? I want to double check, triple check. We'll have all night prayer meetings. People waiting to find out, you know, if, if that actually happened that way. But it doesn't. God doesn't, you people just don't fall dead the moment they make a bad decision. But if you will refuse to follow God and refuse to do it the way God said do it, God will give you to your own devices. And the cost will be great for you. Well, that's not real encouraging. Yes, it is. Because you can choose to make the right decision. Yeah. And you can choose to, to refuse to compromise doing what God said do. 
And be careful when every decision you make is in your own favor and never costs you anything. I'm glad I don't have a tribe of blow dart people back there. I would, I'd, be, I'd turn around and have darts all on my back on that one. Hallelujah. And Samuel said, now listen, Saul's, Saul's, I mean, he is elated. I've kept the command of the Lord. And Samuel goes, what meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I heard? There with the feet right out from under him. One minute you're talking about I've done exactly what the Lord says. The prophet goes, well, I hear sheep and I hear oxen. What's the deal? Because if you'd done what I, the Lord told you to do, I wouldn't hear any sheep and I wouldn't hear any oxen. Well, uh, Saul said they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep of, to, of the oxen to sacrifice. Oh, we can get so spiritual. To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest we utterly destroyed. Oh, yeah. We, we did exactly what the Lord said, except, but that's not what the Lord said. And this is where this kind of deception gets in the people. Yeah. I've heard this before. The Lord knows my heart. I don't care what he knows about your heart. If you ain't doing, if your actions don't convey what your heart's in your heart, you're not obeying God. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord told me as long as he knows, he, he knows my heart. If you loved God and your heart was to obey God, you would do. Yeah. I don't believe that. Well, go check out Jesus and Peter. Peter, lovest thou more than these? Yes, Lord. Then feed my sheep. Three times he asked him. Peter, lovest thou more than me, these, me than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. There has to be an action that relates to your heart. God's looking for actions that relate to your heart. As long as the Lord knows my heart's right. And honey, if your heart's right, you'll have actions that go with it. And that's exactly what Peter, Jesus was telling Peter. If you love me, you're going to do this. Go ahead, shoot them. <laughs> Blow darts all over the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you love God, you're going to choose to do what God wants you to do. Amen. You can't come up with some cockamamie, the Lord knows my heart. That, that doesn't mean anything. So is that your excuse not to do anything because you've got the right heart? And the guy who doesn't have the right heart and doing the right thing doesn't mean anything? Hello? That's exactly what Saul told uh, Samuel. Yeah, we did everything. Look, my heart was to bless the kingdom of God. My heart was to bless God. And so because I want to bless God, we took out the best sheep and the best oxen. We're going to sacrifice those because I want to honor the Lord. No, no. Doing what you think is right and doing it the way you think it ought to be done. And, what, you, know, and listen, you know there was some gig in it for Saul. For, for Saul. This was, not, this was not a monetaryless, monetaryless. This was not something that was lacking monetary gain. Hello? Amen. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, thou wast not made the head of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on the journey. He said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil. Now, that's what's that mean? They went after the money, honey. It won't hurt the king keep a little bit back. And this is what Samuel says. And it's evil in the sight of the Lord. We don't sacrifice it. It was evil. Why? Because they didn't obey. They did not do it the way God said do it. It doesn't matter where I go to church. As long as I go to church somewhere. Yes, it does. Especially if God told you to be somewhere be a part of something. Amen. Hello? Amen. I'm not going to get on who's left and who hadn't left and who was right and who was wrong. And then I'm telling you, there are people in churches and not in, the people in churches in the wrong churches and the people in churches supposed to be in a different church and people in left churches that should have never left. But their heart was right. 
No, they didn't follow God. I'm telling you, not following God's wrong. As a matter of fact, God said it's evil. Why is it evil? Because you rebelled against what God said to do. I wasn't rebellious. I was going to offer a sacrifice. And Saul said unto Samuel, here's, how, here's the prophet of God speaking of, thus saith the Holy Ghost style. Hello? And Saul's going, he's going to maintain his position. Yeah, I obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way of the Lord sent me. And it brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, oh, now we're going to pass the blame. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of all things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Now listen, he, he wasn't supposed to bring the king back alive. He was supposed to kill him. I, I believe that he probably thought that the king had a stash of gold somewhere that was going to weasel it out of him and get rich. Er. Why? The love of money is the root of all evil. And not obeying God was evil. So there had to be some type of monetary gain or something present itself that caused him to make a decision to go this way. But he made a decision not to obey God. And then he blames it on the people. Let me tell you something. If king says kill everything, they kill everything. Nobody disobeyed the king. Hello. He can blame it on the people all he wants to. All he had to do was stand and say, I'm king. The Lord said by the prophet, kill everything. You bring something back, you die. In the story. They come back, dead king, dead cattle, dead oxen, dead everything. But I, may, I get amazed how many Christians, well, I, go around, they'll, they'll, they'll call, dial a prophet to get permission to do what God didn't tell them to do. Hello? Had somebody call me one time, well, actually came to the church and wanted to meet with me and sat down with me and told me, you know, I went to this meeting and heard this and, and, and they prophesied to me this and I, I began to question them. I said, well, the best thing for you to do is put that on file 13. I said, I wouldn't make a decision. I wouldn't make a move on anything that was said there. If you never had that in your heart before, God had never told you anything like that before. It wasn't in your, it's still not in your heart. You're just doing it because you, somebody prophesied over you. They didn't like what I said. They drove three hours to another town to get another pastor to try to can tell them it was okay. I was out of that church. They, they said, well, I went and saw Pastor Ed, and he told me, and the pastor said, what did he tell you? He told me to put it in Final 13. The pastor looked at him and said, he sounded like he gave you good advice. They didn't like that. I'm going to tell you, you, you can ride around. You can find somebody. You'll go find some friend. And they'll look at you and tell you, I don't care what the pastor says. I don't care what the man of God says. I don't care what this one says. You do what you want to do. You'll find somebody. Saul just got the people to tell him they wanted to keep stuff. He said, okay. He's king. I said, he's king. When they start saying we want to keep some stuff, he said, you want to die? That would have been the end of it. He's the king. Are you here? But the people, the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Now, earlier he's talking about he was going to do it. Now, now that the, he, the prophet showed up and started rebuking him, the people wanted to do it. Listen to his, his, his um, response. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? I'm going to stop right there for a second. There are a lot of people who'd rather sacrifice and burn offerings than do what God said to do. They'd rather do what is easy to the flesh than do what costs them time or obedience to the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. There's a great price. I said there's a great price for sacrificing when you should be obeying. There's a great price for burnt offerings when you should be obeying the voice of the Lord. Amen? Listen. Behold, to be obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Listen, he didn't stop here. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft or divination. And stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Listen to his consequence. He has rejected thee from being king.
Hello? That decision cost him his kingdom. Y'all out there, you gone home. That decision cost him his kingdom. To do what he thought was cool or good, the Lord doesn't care as long as he knows my heart. Cost him his kingdom. I'm looking for the dumbfounded look out there. I got a lot of it right now. I wish I could see the internet and see the dumbfounded looks people sitting in the, living, in the computer at their dinner table. The decision to disobey God's voice, God's word, cost him his kingdom. And although he had a backup plan that sounded good, have you ever been around people and they sound so spiritual? Yeah, the Lord showed me that as long as, and, and I did such, such, and I did such, such, and, and, and you all, you're, and, and, and listen, preachers, you better stop this mess of just giving in to whatever people say because you want their money. And you pat them on the back for their greatness or whatever because you want their money. And you better grow up and be men and women of God and tell them you didn't obey God and that's not right. You should have been obeying God instead of doing your own thing. But everybody wants their money. So they don't, won't tell them nothing. They won't tell them anything. Hello? Don't want to tell. I, well, I don't believe you. Man, I took a guy out one time. He came in our church. They, they were with this multi-level marketing group years ago. And they had gone to a church about an hour and a half away. And that church had gone from 80 people to 600 people in just a couple of months. Except it was 600 on Sunday morning and it was nothing on Wednesday and Wednesday night because they were all out selling the product. One night they went out and sold the product. Next, the other night of church week, they were delivering the product. Everybody was buying their own product. That's how they say in business. You know how it works. And um, this guy, and, and the pastor said, well, there's a church over in Greensboro. You guys are driving from Greensboro. Why don't you go over there? He wouldn't take me out to lunch. Oh, yeah, going to take me out to lunch. And he's sitting there talking about their great product and this kind of stuff. And I said, look, I know all about it. And I said, you're not going to get me in it. I'm the pastor, and I'm not going to have the people in church when every time they see me come into the house to visit, or if I come, you know, we, we get together and go have lunch or something after church or whatever, you're, they're not going to be sitting there wondering, is he going to draw out and start drawing circles for me? <laughs> Hello? They're not going to, they, they'll never have to wonder, is that my pastor coming, or is that my multi-level marketing up tier coming? Say, so I don't do it. So you can forget working on me. He said, well, I'm going to tell you, we're going to do for this church what we did for that church over there in that other city. And I just leaned across the table. He's buying my lunch, but, you know, I, I got to pay for it. Right. I leaned across the table and looked at him. I said, let me tell you how it is. The first time I catch you with one of my church members cornered and tell them that because they're not self-employed, they're in a rut. And a rut's just a gray with both ends kicked out. I'm going to pick you up by the seat of the pants and throw you out the front door. Are we clear? <laughs> We're going to grow this church. We're going to bring all these people in, hundreds, hundreds of people. Yeah, I'll throw you right out the front door. Because the Bible said, the, remember, I'll not have it said that any man made me rich. Abraham said, I'll not have it said that any man made Abraham rich. I'll throw you out the front door. We good? Oh, we're good. Okay, okay. I said, just so you understand. Hello? The lie is, if you're not self-employed, you're, 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 you're in a grave with that's a rut, which is both great. I don't care. You're going to bring 600 people in here? I don't care. That pastor almost lost everything because he gave into that. And finally, when he, God arrested him, and he started preaching church commitment, like be here beside Sunday mornings. There, it was three Sunday mornings a month because one Sunday morning a month, they all went over to the multi-level marketing family convention over in another state and all 600 all 520 of them went over there for that and so they go from 600 600 600 to 80 we're gonna do for you uh -huh. oh the money's good oh it's great to see the money i, <laughs> I cut that off at the, i mean i cut that off with the kneecaps he didn't last but a couple more sundays yeah i'll tell him 
had a group come here one time. The church had split. They were, they were in the middle of a split. Hadn't quite started the other church yet. Shut up one Sunday. We had 50 other people in church. We'd never seen them before. 50? Boy, that's overnight growth. Hallelujah. Found out they all came from the same church where they were splitting. So I got up the next Sunday. He said, guys, I know there's something going on over at such and such church. I know that people are hurting. I know there's a lot of stuff going on. I said, and we, we'll be a safe harbor for a season. But our ultimate goal is to restore you to the church you came from and not take all the people into our church. I said, because that church is now hurting. And I said, it's not good for all this to be going on. It's not where the body of Christ. They all left. I'm not going to compromise what God said to do. I'm not going to hurt another church this week and say, oh, well, look at how God's blessed us with new growth. Yeah, right. Ain't new growth. Those people are hurt or, or, or angry or something and showing up over here. Hello? I've done, I've done that three or four times over the years. You could have a bigger church and bigger problems. Because one thing, I'm not, I'm not willing to lose the anointing getting numbers. Yeah. I believe you can grow and have numbers and have the anointing, but I'm not going to do it the wrong way. Hello. And pastors, you need to get strong. And, 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 and this, it may cost you in a season, pastors. It may cost you a season of difficult times where it seems like you're not going to make it. But obeying and doing what God said always pays off in the end. Yeah. Always pays off in the end. And you don't ever have to look back over your back and you don't have to, ever have to wonder when you're going to reap your harvest of bad seed sown. Amen. So, anyway. So, here we go. He, he goes and does exactly what God told him not to do. And the, the amazing thing is, he start, he's arguing the case that I did do what the Lord said do. How can you argue that you did what the Lord told you to do? And, you, and that's what that's Sam is like. And if you find out, Sam goes and the first thing he does is kill the king that they brought back. What? <laughs> He's supposed to have been dead already. What's he doing in life? White head goes off. Sword wielding prophet. Yeah. You didn't do what you're supposed to do, but I'll take care of it. Hello. He, he, he got to think Sam's going back, but, but he's got to tell me where the, where, where the gold is. First. Oh, well. <laughs> Maybe he's got a map on his body. Yeah. Hello? Cost him his kingdom because he didn't obey. Right, right. And you got Christians who are walking around telling everybody that, that, you know, how blessed they are. And let me tell you something. Here's the thing. Other Christians will tell you how wonderful you are in your sin. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen. Amen. I've seen them in disobedience. I've seen pastors split churches and people go and tell them how great a pastor he is. He just split a church. Took the church in half and moved over here across town. Got, and, then, and then five years later, they, they run you out of town because you're making one. You got a private line put in. And the secretary opened up the bill that you had privately come to you. This happened, actually happened in Greensboro. Split one of the largest charismatic churches in half. Then that pastor went out there just a few years later. He went and had a private phone line put in his office. And the bill came. The secretary opened it inadvertently. And it was all 1-900 telephone numbers. He had a private line put in. He was getting the bills privately. And he was paying the bills so he could call and have phone sex. Now that is just... What's the right word? I'm trying to replace of a good, good, good gumption. To sit in the church office and have phone sex. Nasty. Brown, that's just nasty. All right. <laughs> yeah. Five years earlier, they split a church. They were assistant pastor and split a church. It took half the church. Everybody talked about how great they were, how wonderful the church was, how great a preacher he was, how great a pastor he was. I'm telling you, you make wrong decisions. You know what? You don't split churches to start a church. That's not how God starts churches. That pastor of the church they split even offered to plant a church and give them 25 families to keep from splitting the church. And they wouldn't do it. Make it a sister church. Make it a church plant. Make it right. Do it with the right spirit so it wouldn't be destructive. No? Why? Because 350 is better than about 100 people. You live better on 350 people than you can on 100 people. Welcome to the church of the frozen chosen. 
got quiet in here. Let's go ahead and cover these last two bad decisions, and then tonight we'll get into how to make right decisions. Hallelujah, <laughs> Belinda says. Yeah, hallelujah. Here's another bad decision we're not going to read. It's going to throw it out there at you. Abraham hearkened to the voice of his wife, Sarah. Yeah. Hello. Now, 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 listen to your wife is not always a bad thing, but when your wife says go sleep with somebody else, that's a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> we have no record that Abraham even slightly argued with her. Right. <laughs> Probably had five guys around saying, does your wife have a sister? <laughs> Hello? The Bible says that Sarah came to him and said, no, I haven't had a child. Said, go unto Hagar and see if you can conceive with her. And Abraham and Hagar went in the tent. Hello? There's no, we have no record. He even slightly argued. The Bible actually says he hearkened. <laughs> hearkened. What did God tell him? He told him he's going to have a seed. And he didn't say it was going to be. And then later on he came back and rebuked him. Even when he was, even when he was 99, the Lord set, showed up and said, you know, um, <clears throat> this time next year you're going to have a son. And, and Abraham says, well, you know, the Ishmael might live before you. And then later he says, cast out the bond woman. It was never the plan of God. Right. And we're still paying the price for Ishmael. Amen. Hello? The Middle East has all kinds of problems because of a couple of nights in the tent. Hearkening to the voice of his wife. Do you see how, how these decisions last not just a couple of days, centuries, millennia? These decisions have cost mankind. And then another decision is 1 Samuel 12. We're kind of over there in chapter, uh, just back up a little bit. You kind of think the whole nation got in on this one. You look at the whole chapter and kind of look at the Israel wanted a king. Now, I'm not going to read that much in here. You could actually, I may not read anything. But the people come to Samuel and say, we want a king. And God says, I, God, God, he says, God's your king. No, we want, we want one to put on a horse, put him on, parade him out to the battlefield, and you know, all that kind of stuff. They wanted, they, they, they got, they wanted to have the look. They had to have it on their polo shirt and their topsider <laughs> shoes and their, you know, your, your dockers and your, your shorts, that, you know, the right kind of shorts, you know, to go out and do whatever you do. He had to look good. Israel wanted to have a king, and God wanted to be their king. Now, and, and, and Samuel went to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, he said, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. And he gave him a king, and the first king they got was Saul. Yeah. Well, see what Saul did. Got them all in trouble. Hello? Mm -hmm. They chose a king over God. Let me say this. You cannot choose things over God. When God says, I want it this way, you need to follow God's way. God said we're to walk by faith and not by sight. I don't like that like living by faith business. It's tough. I just rather, nah. Well, go have your king. Go have your carnal way of doing things. Do it the way you want to do it and see how that works out. And get back to me later and tell me how that worked out. Hello? Doing it your way. I mean, Frank Sinatra singing in your car, I did it my way, or the Elvis version, whichever one you prefer. Frank's was first, I think. Singing, I did it my way. When God says, I'll be your king. In the new covenant, he wants to be your king. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to be your master. He wants to guide. He wants to lead you. He wants to be the one that brings you into the things you need. But people are all the time wanting somebody else to do it for them. You know, you're a study, so yourself approved, a workman, and you not be ashamed. I know that's written to Timothy, but I'm telling you, church, that's, that's written to you too. You need to be a student of the Bible. And I don't care who, with what kind of hairstyle, what kind of technology they got, gets up and says stuff on television, and everybody wants to run after it uh, because it's, it's cool and everybody's excited about it. What does the Bible say? Yeah. Now we got people saying the parts of the Bible don't even apply. Yeah. We got people saying they're they're even writing on, on posts on the internet now saying don't read Peter and John and James because Paul rebuked them and they didn't agree with him. 
Why? Because there's things in there that are countermanding what they're teaching and their teachings. Of course, they're going to have to get rid of about half what Paul wrote because Paul rebuked himself. In other words, Paul, Paul, wrote from two, Paul wrote two different perspectives. He wrote a God side and a man side. And you blend those together and you get the whole. There are people that are saying they're getting Bibles and leaving verses out because it doesn't agree with their doctrine. You better follow God. You better not set up a man as your king. I love Dad Hagen. I love what he preached. I loved how he preached. He's not my God. And I know there were times that Dad Hagen would say stuff and I'd go, I I'm just not sure about that. I can't, I can't, I can't see that. And I can't, I couldn't go out and preach and I couldn't act on it because I couldn't see it. I still loved him. Still appreciated his ministry. Still got every, bunches of stuff out of all the other stuff. Sometimes he'd say stuff and I'd go, huh, I don't know. I, 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 you know just, now maybe later on I would come to agree with it. Maybe not. It doesn't matter. He wasn't my king. Right. I love him. He's a spiritual father. It's great, Pastor. But God's my king. Jesus is my king. Great. Great. Amen? Amen? You can't let a man be your king. Right. God, will, God, God says, I'm a jealous God, and I will not share my glory with any man. He's not going to share his glory. Hello? In your life with a, different, with a preacher. I believe it's right to honor the people in your life. That, there's, there's principles there. They're, they're good. But they're not your king. They're not your Holy Ghost. I'm not your king. I'm not your Holy Ghost. Right, right. And just because I say you better be like the Bereans. Yes. Don't be like those in Thessalonica. Yes. The Bible says when Paul was preaching, it says that when he went to Berea, the, those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things be true or not. Hello. You don't need a king. Don't set up a king in your life. It'll cost you. Because if they go astray, you go astray. Hello? I, listen, one of my favorite preachers started preaching some stuff, and, and I can't agree with it. A number of years ago, they were preaching some stuff. I couldn't agree with it. Loved them. Still love them. Still support them. Still think they're, they're, they're anointing their God. There's some stuff they're preaching I can't agree with. And it hurt the church. But I, have, I mean, I still love them. Still, still appreciate their ministry. They're good ministry. Hello. Still listen to them. Still get blessed by them. Amen. But they're not a king in my life. We got people right now, there's a movement going on in the body of Christ right now, that one person can say one thing and everybody, oh, yeah. it's, it's the gospel because they said it. They said it. That means it's true. Hello? I said, hello? And don't make it true just because one man says it. You better study the Bible. You have, a, and that's a decision. Now tonight, tonight, we're going to get into how, and I, so Pastor Ed, you said that when you started that? Well, we're, we're working there. It's a work in progress. I'm going to build a house. You know, you show up two days after I say, we, we start pouring the footage. You say, where's the house? We're working on it. We're pouring the footers. I'll tell you what, you don't want me to build your house and not pour footers. Hello? I actually do a soil sample to make sure that, that regular footers work because if they don't, then you have to put in rebar. You know, some soil you have to put in rebar to make sure it's right. Not always, but sometimes you do. If the soil's not right or whatever, you're going to have to dig down deep and put rebar into the, into the footer. Or what will happen? Your house will settle and crack all the pieces. So we're, we're, put, we're pouring footers right now. Now tonight we're going to start putting block down on top of the footage. Footage has been poured. All right? The ugly work's been done. Have you ever gone up to a house that's being built? You know, the holes are all in the ground. They got the stakes out of the lines drawn. And you think, that, that, how's that going to be this house I saw over here in the picture? That's just ugly. It's nasty, muddy. Concrete's not pretty. It's not smooth. They don't, they don't go smooth that out. They don't need to smooth it. Semi, but not really, because they're going to they're they're level out with the... With the, uh, the um, Mortar. <laughs> we start laying block or, stay, or laying the brick. We, you know. So we're we're, we're doing the uh, foundation work, but we're gonna get we're gonna get in there and start getting into how to make the right decision. We've shown you the consequences of the wrong ones. Now we're getting into how to make the right ones.
and doing the right ones and where the right ones come from. Why? Because if you, if you, if you know the, the, the consequences of making bad decisions and then you move to make right decisions and have the information on how to make that right decision, you can walk in places with God. You can go in places in God that you cannot go without that information. And you will grow and mature and be blessed and be strong and be stable and be an effective Christian in your daily walk. Amen. Without falling into constant pit holes for making wrong decisions. And when somebody says, I don't care what the Bible says or I don't care what the preacher says about what the Bible says, you better just run for them. Just pack it up and run. Because they ain't been reading their Bible. Yeah. Hello. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this word. Thank you that you're working in us and you're building something. And you're bringing us into that place so we can make godly, Christ-centered, biblical decisions under the guidance and tutelage of the Holy Ghost through the mind of Christ out of the word of God. You're bringing us to that place so we can do these things and not make decisions that, that, that bring dire consequences, but decisions that bring blessing, bring us into the plan of God and the heart of God. We thank you, dear Father, that those are, that have been listening. We thank you that you're, you're stirring them up and challenging them in the name of Jesus to walk in a place of making right decisions. If you're here this morning, keep your heads bowed and eyes closed, please. If you're watching us by the internet or you're watching or you're here in the service with this morning, and you're saying, Pastor Ed, I'm not right with God. I'm not born again. Jesus is not my Lord. Those in this congregation, would you raise your hand? If you're not right with God, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord. Say, so, Pastor Ed, I'm born again. I, I know I've got saved, but I'm backslid. I'm not. I'm, I'm backslidden. I need to get that restored. I need to be. I need to get back to a place with God. I need to be. Anybody here, everyone, that's you. Raise your hand. One more offering. You, Pastor Ed, I'm born again, love God, but I'm not baptized with the Holy Ghost. What do you mean by that? Acts 2, 4, they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? All right. Well, I accept your testimony. Now, those of you watching by the Internet, uh, I want to pray a prayer with you because if you're out there and, and, and you've tuned in this broadcast and you're watching it and you're at this point, you say, well, yeah, I don't even know Jesus. I want to lead you in a prayer that bring you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So simply right where you are, just close your eyes, lift one hand to heaven because that's where your help comes from. It comes from the Lord. And say this prayer with me. Say, dear God in heaven, I come to you today. I recognize I'm lost and without God. I ask that Jesus Christ come into my heart. I confess him as the Lord of my life. And I believe that you, dear Father God in heaven, have raised him from the dead. I receive the salvation from heaven now in Jesus' name. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer with me this morning, I want to ask you to do something. Please email us at uh, office at fbc.org or call our church office at 336-852-0088. We'll get someone to contact you back and to pray with you individually. We want to send you some materials on what it means to be born again and, and come into the family of God. We want you to know. We love you. We're for you. The best days of your life now start for you now because you come into the family of God. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. God, I trust Amen. Today's message was a blessing to you on making right decisions. We know from the Word of God that different Bible characters made the wrong decisions in life and it cost them. But you know what? Through the Word of God, the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, and the mind of Christ, you can make right decisions that will lead you into the plan and purposes of God. So we're so grateful that you joined us today. I also want to invite you to uh, visit our website at www fvc.org. There's a place there that you can search to our website, find the archives of videos and audios. You can also give online if you are so inclined to do. We just uh, encourage you to continue to follow our ministry and let God's Word minister and bless your life. Until next time, this is Pastor Ed Taylor of Faith and Victory Church saying that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith.